believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. And we have a lift off. It's going on. It's moving back. The Saturn V lifting off the power. In May 1961, President Kennedy made the challenge to land men on the moon and return safely before 1970. That goal was reached in July 1969 when astronauts Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin landed on the moon during the Apollo 11 mission. By the end of 1972, 12 men had walked on the moon and returned over 800 pounds of lunar rocks and soil. What have we learned about the moon from studying these rocks during the last 10 years, and how has this added to our knowledge about the Earth and the rest of the solar system? Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Astronomy Toronto. My name is Randy Atwood. Astronomy Toronto is produced by the Rogers Cable TV Network and is seen here on Rogers the last Wednesday of every month. Tonight, we'll be looking back at the Apollo program and discuss what we've learned about the moon and the rest of the solar system during the last 10 years. We will talk to one of the astronauts who walked on the moon, Dr. Edgar Mitchell, and also my guest tonight is Dr. David Strangway, who is currently president and provo at the University of Toronto. Good evening, Dr. Strangway. Thanks very much for coming here tonight. How are you, Randy? Glad to be here. What have we learned in the last 10 years? I'm sure all the lunar samples are still down in Houston or all around the world. Yes. What are we learning from these rocks brought back from the moon? Well, we're still learning lots of things, but uh, the missions really consisted, uh, I guess, in the early years of the, uh, what I would call a description phase. We were describing the samples, we were describing the physical properties, we were describing their ages, we were describing their chemistry, and uh, that occupied an awful lot of people for a long time. Now, the uh, kinds of issues that are being worked on with the samples are very different. People are now asking very specific questions. Can I find a sample that will address a specific problem, or can I find a group of samples that I can use to answer a certain question? So the whole of lunar science has moved on, of course, to a, to a very new and very different kind of atmosphere where we're asking different questions, of course, than we did before the missions and even much different than right after the missions. One of the strange things about it is to you think of the questions we were asking before the missions, think of the questions we were asking during the missions, and think of the questions we're asking now. Uh, before the mission, we were asking ourselves such simple questions as, is the moon hot or cold? Uh, by the time we had the first sets of data under our belt, had a chance to look at the volcanic rocks and uh, the ages and so on, the question changed entirely, and we never really noticed it until we looked back. The question now becomes, or then became, uh, which parts of it were hot and when were they hot? Not was it hot or cold, but which parts were hot and during what part of the history were they hot? The first Apollo crew were killed in a flash fire during a test of their spacecraft in January 1967, just a month before their scheduled launch. It was nearly two years before the redesigning, construction, and testing of the spacecraft were completed before the first Apollo mission got off. This was in 1968. The mission was Apollo 7, and the three astronauts orbited the Earth for 11 days, testing out the new spacecraft. Apollo 8 orbited the moon on Christmas Eve 1968 and sent back man's first views of Earth from the moon. The mission proved that man could navigate to the moon and back and cleared the way for a lunar landing. Apollos 9 and 10 tested the new lunar module, which would carry two astronauts to the lunar surface and the spacesuit, which they would use during their moonwalks. The stage was set for Apollo 11, the first manned lunar landing attempt. and astronaut Neil Armstrong would serve as mission commander. Armstrong would be the first man to step upon the moon. This is how it looked 
out one of the windows of the lunar module, codenamed Eagle, as it descended to the first manned lunar landing on July 20th, 1969. Altitude 1600, 1400 feet, still looking very good. 700 feet, 21 down, 33 degrees. 100 feet, down at 19. 1201. 1201. Roger, 1201 alarm. We're go, same tide, we're go. Altitude, velocity, light, three and a half down, 220 feet, 15 forward, 11 forward, coming down nicely, 200 feet, four and a half down, five and a half down, 60 seconds, lights on, down two and a half, forward, forward, that's 40 feet down, two and a half, Picking up some dust. Four forward. Four forward. Drift into the right a little. That's okay. Contact light. Okay, engine stop. We copy you down, Eagle. Tranquility base here. The Eagle has landed. Roger, Twink. Tranquility, we copy you on the ground. You got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breathing again. Thanks a lot. A few hours later, Neil Armstrong climbed down the ladder on the front landing gear of the Eagle and stepped out onto the lunar surface. This is how we saw it live from the moon. Foot of the ladder, the lamb foot beds are only uh, uh, depressed in the surface about uh, one or two inches. Now, although the surface appears to be uh, very, very fine grained as you get close to it. It's almost like a powder. Ground mass uh, is very fine. I'm going to step off the lamb now. One small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. The two astronauts spent two hours collecting rocks and soil, taking pictures, deploying experiments, and testing out their moon legs. Their successful return to Earth completed President Kennedy's goal. Man had walked on the moon and returned safely. Their trip was heralded as the most historic trip ever made. The astronauts went on a worldwide tour as the scientists got their first real hands-on look at lunar samples. Well, you were down in Houston during the years of the, the Apollo missions took place, 1969 to, I guess, 1972, and were involved in the process of examining the first samples as they came back, is yes, that correct? Yes, that's quite right, yes. I was very much involved. I was one of the, the sample investigators and worked on the very first lunar samples. Uh, I was involved in uh, not so much in the training for the first mission, but I was very much involved in the geophysical part of the missions, the later missions, uh, training the uh, site selections, the experiments that were selected. Uh, we had an experiment of our own on Apollo 17 as well. So, well, it's very interesting. Are there any special memories or highlights of your stay in Houston that uh, you could tell us about uh, working down at the spacecraft center in in Houston? Well, they were some of the most exciting years of one's life, as you can imagine. Uh, it was a fine place to live, perhaps not downtown Houston, but where we lived, right out near the Space Center. And uh, everybody in the community was involved in the same kinds, of, same kinds of missions. So there was a real sense of mission, a sense of excitement, uh, a sense of working together, a sense of working in mission control to do the science backroom work and so on. So there was a... I guess there's no one thing that stands out, but just the whole sense of excitement of everybody in an enormous complex pulling together to get a job done. I think we have a slide of the full moon, and if we could take a look at that, you think you'll notice, well, anyone who's looked at the full moon noticed that there are light parts and there are dark parts. What are these different parts, Dr. Strangway? Well, I think one of the points I wanted to make is, uh, of course, uh, you've got the highlands and the, and the uh, so-called mare, the, uh, uh, the Latin word, of course, for oceans. But uh, the highlands, uh, we had several missions to the highlands, and they've told us a lot about their ages and compositions. And the dark parts, which look very much younger, uh, in fact, turned out not to be so much younger. These are volcanic rocks, however, that have filled up very ancient craters. 
Where did the first moon landing go? Is it the darker places? Are they the nice flat areas where there's not too many hills? That's right. The very first missions landed in the in the dark colored areas in the Mari basins because they were smoother. They were uh, much less filled with craters. There weren't mountains nearby, and. Uh, during the second mission, they targeted a pinpoint landing uh, on purpose right next to the Surveyor spacecraft. And of course, the whole object of that was to prove that they could put the missions in future anywhere they wanted, even if they were near mountains or near large craters. I think the next slide, too, shows uh, one of the very l largest craters that we can see. Sometimes even people can see it with the naked eye. In the top left-hand corner, mm -hmm. there are a big hole called Copernicus. Yes. Yes, that's one of the very large and much younger craters. We didn't get any samples from Copernicus, but uh, we have a feeling that at the Apollo 14 landing site, uh, where we brought back the uh, so-called fromoral samples, that some of those seem to have been intermixed with Copernicus ray material that was excavated from Copernicus. And uh, if that interpretation is correct, then uh, we have an age for Copernicus of about a billion years. When they opened the first sample box and they you brought back the, the first uh, samples from Apollo 11. What was the feeling? I mean, were there any surprises, things that you totally didn't expect to find that were found? Well, that's an interesting question. Uh, the first look at it, of course, is they look just like the things they were used to looking at. Uh, if you just glanced at them rather casually, uh, the stuff was very powdery because there was a lot of soil that had been collected and that was uh, extremely fine, almost like carbon black or something of that sort. Uh, and then, when one looked a little more closely, you very quickly found that the soil was composed of lots of little particles of glass and uh, melted uh, little spherical balls and so on all through it. And then, of course, the volcanic samples themselves, which looked so incredibly fresh, looked exactly like, uh, like a, a basalt or a volcanic rock that would have erupted in Hawaii last year, perhaps. Uh, that's what these things look like. Here we have a close-up view of a lunar sample. And uh, it, it seems as if it, it has bubbles in it. Yes, this is a particular sample from the Apollo 17 landing site. Uh, it's one of the very large samples that was returned, several kilograms in weight, in fact. Uh, a lot of interesting characteristics about this. You notice the bubbles, or as the geologists would call them, vesicles in this. This is clearly when the eruption that took place that formed this volcanic rock, there were gases around. And those gases are what created those bubbles, uh, in effect. It looks very much like a terrestrial basalt. If you wandered around in uh, western Canada or in the northwestern part of the United States, you'd find volcanic rocks which you could pick up and uh, just, just first look at them. They'd look exactly like, the, like this sample when you just looked at them casually. Well, how old are these samples that we're bringing back from the moon? Well, I was very intrigued to, to point out that particular sample because that sample is about 3.9 billion years in age. That represents some of the dark Mari basins that we were talking about earlier. The dark basins have a range of ages from about 3.3 billion years to about 3.9 billion years. Uh, we haven't found anything younger than that. There might be a few spots where there's younger stuff. And uh, when you get older than 3.9 billion years, you get into the highland material, which is so heavily cratered and impacted and uh, uh, crushed and recrushed and melted and ground and so on that, uh, that, that you don't get these uh, very nice, clear volcanic rocks. So the volcanic rocks then are 3.9 to 3.3 billion years in age. Well, we, uh, all these craters, are they caused by all, this, uh, all these volcanoes or, or is there another source for all the craters? No, the craters are really the accumulation of the whole of uh, geological history. Uh, impacts coming from meteorites, large and small, hitting the lunar surface. Uh, there's been just an immense amount of bombardment. And one of the exciting findings of the lunar program was that uh, if you go back from 3.9 billion years to 4 billion years, you'll find that most of the highlands are 4 billion years, approximately 4 billion years in age. What that simply means is that between the time the moon was formed and 4 billion years, there was very intense bombardment going on in the solar system. And then it slowed down very dramatically between 4.9 and 3 billion years. And although it's gone on since then, it's gone on at a very much slower rate. Now, this record is preserved on the lunar surface because we don't have any weathering and uh, we don't have plate tectonics that are uh, taking things down trenches and, uh, and, and recycling them. So uh, we have a very clear record of this, of this bombardment history of the, uh, of the solar system. Well, in comparison, what is the oldest rock? How old would be the oldest rock you'd find on the Earth? The very oldest rock that's ever been measured on Earth has come from, uh, from Greenland, and it was about 3.7 to 3.8 billion years. Uh, the 
oldest of the volcanic rocks that I referred to is 3.9 billion years. The highlands are essentially 4 billion years, although there have been a few chips that have been extracted from some of the highland samples that have been as old as about 4.5 billion years. So we're pretty sure the moon itself is 4.6 billion years old. It has rocks that have been uh, reheated and melted and so on right through to 4.9 billion years, 4 billion years, and then comes the, uh, the, the much slower uh, time of, of impacting. But do we have any reason to believe that the Earth is younger than the moon, or they're about the same age, or how can we tell? Well, we really can't tell in, uh, in, in any sense of detail uh, because the terrestrial record has been, has been destroyed. Uh, these rocks, even the ones in Greenland that I referred to, are very isolated exposures here and there. A few rocks in parts of Canada that are 3.6 or 3.7 billion years, but uh, uh, we have very little of this with which to compare. It seems reasonable that if the oldest rock on Earth, though, is 3.7 or 3.8 billion years, the oldest rock on the Moon is 4.5 billion years, it seems pretty likely that both of the objects formed at the same time. And usually we use the age of meteorites for the age of this, and they're about 4.6 billion years. Almost all of them are about 4.6 billion years in age. This is a picture of one of the uh, samples from the, uh, from the Lunar Highlands, which is showing the, uh, the bombarded and reworked rocks that I was referring to. You can see the dark material, the light material. The white material in this is really what forms the bulk of the lunar crust. Uh, we call it a northosite uh, uh, material. It's, uh, it's quite common on Earth, but we don't find it in the same abundance as we found on the lunar surface. So the lunar highlands are largely made of a northosite, and then they're intermixed with other, other kinds of materials. This is the landing site at Apollo 17. You can see the rover in the foreground. But the point I really wanted to make with this slide is that the dark, flat surface in the foreground is a mare surface at Apollo 17. And this is where that sample of 3.9 billion years came from. The light colored stuff in the background is part of the highlands. And these are where these very uh, intensely bombarded and as we call them, brecciated rocks come from. And uh, those highland areas are about 4 billion years in age. And you can see the tremendous difference between what looks very old and what looks very young, it's only about 100 million years difference, which uh, for the numbers we're talking about isn't much. Not much. And it looks like those mountains are just rising right out of uh, a flat That's surface. Right. And That's right. Very stark yes. surface yes. indeed. Let's go to the next slide, which will show us this lunar time scale. Maybe you could explain <laughs> this what, to us what all this means. What I've tried to show here, and we maybe see a, a few more slides that look like this for uh, some of the other, uh, the other planets. Uh, is a scale going from zero the present day back one, two, three, four, five billion years. What I'm showing here is that somewhere around 4.6 billion years, there was a formation of the moon, the crust formed at that time, and there probably was a fairly widespread melting event, intense bombardment up until four billion years, and then this period of volcanic activity, and then nothing. The important point that I wanted to make here is between 3.9 and 4 billion years, we have a marker, uh, which if the record hasn't been destroyed, we can use in other parts of the solar system. If they're bombarded and saturated with craters, they're more than 4 billion years. If they're not, they're younger than 4 billion years. If you ask someone who was the first man on the moon, they'll probably answer correctly, Neil Armstrong. If you ask them who was the second man, they may know it was Buzz Aldrin. But does anyone know who the third or fourth or even the twelfth man to walk on the su lunar surface was? Probably not. The fact is that Apollo 11 was definitely the lunar mission for the history books, while all the others were really going to go to the moon and get some rocks and do some good lunar science. In November 1969, Apollo 12 was to be a repeat performance of Apollo 11, except that the two astronauts, Pete Conrad and Alan Bean, spent about twice as much time out on the lunar surface. Also, to prove that they could land with, with pinpoint accuracy, the landing site for Apollo 12 was, in, was set to be within 250 meters of an unmanned spacecraft called Surveyor, which had landed there on the moon about two years before. Parts of the Surveyor were cut off and returned to Earth for analysis to find out what effect a few years on the moon has on metals. The astronauts also set up a lunar science experiment station called ALSEP. What was the use of the ALSEP experiment package that uh, I think the last uh, four or five missions that landed on the moon set up? The ALSEP experiment package was a, an interesting uh, geophysical uh, package which had different experiments on it at different times. Uh, 
Some of them were directed towards analysis of properties of the moon and the interior itself, and others of the experiments on those packages were simply used to expose to the, uh, to the solar wind so that you could analyze the particles that were coming in from the sun and so on. So uh, it was used, as I say then, to analyze the, the nature, the charged particles, the composition in some cases of the materials that were, that were really blowing in with the solar wind itself, which of course isn't very much of a wind, but uh, nevertheless one could do those analyses. At the same time, on that package uh, in the earlier part were seismographs so that one could look at the uh, events of uh, lunar, lunar quakes, lunar moon quakes, and so on. Uh, but also, what was equally interesting was that each time that we'd left a package behind, uh, when there was either a launch or, a, uh, or an impact onto the lunar surface, there would be another event which took place. We knew exactly when it took place, and we could measure the time that it took the seismic waves to travel through different parts of the moon. And by the end of the program, we had several seismic stations out. And when they took the spent capsules and bombarded them back onto the surface, uh, we had quite a, quite a good array out there, a good geophysical array. I think they, uh, I heard somebody quote that when the first uh, spacecraft impacted on the lunar surface, on purpose, of course, the moon rang like a bell. And it was yes. very surprising. Yes, it was. This was, uh, if I take a minute to describe that, it's, it was very surprising because uh, we're not used to that environment. What the fact was is that when you have a, an environment which is free of moisture and is, is, is high vacuum conditions, the rocks and the soils will tend to weld themselves together. And in welding themselves together, they will propagate seismic waves very readily. Whereas in the Earth, we've got little bits of moisture that occur between the grains and so on, and the seismic energy doesn't propagate very well. So when the first events took place, uh, they were really remarkable because energy was simply bouncing around through the surface off cracks and fractures and uh, craters and all sorts of things. And that's what really caused the ringing. It was the energy bouncing around in this very broken up surface. I might mention, too, that uh, once uh, we were extremely fortunate in the later part of the missions, uh, when the whole array had been out and we had four seismic stations up and working, there was a very large meteorite impact that occurred on the backside of the moon. And when that happened, we were able to get energy that had gone all the way through the moon, right through the center, and into four different detectors on the front side of the moon. And that was a tremendously fortunate circumstance. Apollo 13 was launched in April 1970. The landing site for this mission was to be in the lunar highlands, not the flat plains of the moon, where the two previous missions had landed. However, the moon mission was aborted on the way to the moon, and the astronauts were brought back safely to the Earth after one of the oxygen tanks in the surface service module exploded, damaging the rest of the spacecraft systems. The first sign of problem sounded like this. April 13, 1970. The mood could only be described as relaxed. Apollo 13, man's fifth lunar mission, the third, scheduled to land on the moon, continued its tranquil coast. This is the crew of Apollo 13. We wish everybody there a nice evening, and uh, we're just about ready to close out our inspection of Aquarius and get back to a pleasant evening at Odyssey. Good night. 13, we've got one more item for you when you get a chance. We'd like it to uh, stir up your cryo tanks. In addition, uh, I have a shaft and trunnion okay. for a look at the Comet Bennett if you need it. Okay. Stand by. Okay, yes, oh, sir, Houston. we've had a problem here. This is Houston. Say again, please. Yes, sir. Oh, Houston, we've had a problem. We've had a main B bus undervolt. Roger, main B undervolt. Okay, stand by, 13. We're looking at it. And we had a pretty large bang associated with the um, caution and warning there. The only way for the men to return was to use the oxygen, water, power, and propulsion systems in the lunar module. If the explosion had occurred after the lunar landing, they would not have been able to return. Here are pictures of the damaged service module taken by the crew showing that a side panel had been blown off by the force of the explosion. Modifications were made to the Apollo spacecraft after the Apollo 13 accident. The crew for Apollo 14 was scheduled to land at the same landing site as Apollo 13. They were Stu Rusa, Al Shepard, and Ed Mitchell. Shepard, in the middle, was America's first man to go into space. He and Mitchell, seen on the right, 
would be the fifth and sixth men to walk on the moon. I recently talked to Dr. Mitchell about his flight to the moon on Apollo 14. Dr. Mitchell, what was the main objective for Apollo 14, and why was Cone Crater, the, the area, so important? Well, the uh, <clears throat> area of Cone, around Cone Crater represented a, a drill, as it were, into the primordial lunar crust. And uh, by the techniques of sampling around the crater, we could sample rocks that originally had been deep in the crust of the moon. And uh, that's the standard sampling technique, geological sampling technique. And as a result, we were able to get data that uh, because of the crater that science really hadn't had before about inside the lunar surface. Were we able to get that sample? Yes, those indeed we were. And how old were they? Well, we had some of the very old materials in excess of 4.6 billion years old that came out of the uh, Promaro. Was there any apprehension uh, for NASA or the crew of Apollo 14 following the failure of Apollo 13? Well, no, I think more of a sigh of relief when we found that problem and said, okay, now we've got that out of our way, let's go on to the rest of it. The launch of the mighty Saturn V rocket was always a spectacular sight. Here's how the launch looked on January 31st, 1971 of Apollo 14. 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, ignition sequence start, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Launch commit, liftoff. We have liftoff with Apollo 14. Three minutes past the hour. The tower is clear. Houston is controlling. It's right now. 16 seconds, pitch and roll program started. 14 maneuvering to a proper flight course. Shepard reports roll program completed. Pitch profile still in progress. 37 seconds. All right, one Bravo now. Okay, we're one Bravo. Capcom, board of board, and range number. Pressure coming down, adjusting from sea level to a space environment. We have a remote camera. Status check in mission control, coming up all greens on the flight director's console. In Houston, everything looks good here on the ground. Right. Oh, One well, minute, 19 right? seconds, That's coming great. up on period of maximum aerodynamic be... pressure on the vehicle. That, that camera you see is further down range. It's down the Florida coast here, and apparently they've got a clear shot. Huh? I think this is the Rivero Beach camera, in fact, yeah. way down there. Yes, it looks great. It's what, uh, it's what, 60 miles down, down the coast? One minute, uh, 35 seconds, uh, 9 nautical miles in altitude, 5 nautical miles downrange. Uh, velocity now reading uh, 33, uh, 140 feet per second. Another 15 seconds, all of those uh, first stage engines cut down. The other four on the outer Mark, ring. Two minutes, 35 seconds, uh, coming up uh, on staging. That's a great shot. Beautiful. Roger. And separation. Roger. Ignition on five. Roger. Everything went smoothly during Earth orbit and for the burn that sent Apollo 14 toward the moon. Then Stuart Rusa moved the command module Kitty Hawk to a docking with the lunar module Antares, still attached to the third stage of the booster. Twice they tried. Three times. Okay, Houston, I hit it pretty good and held four seconds on contact and we did not latch. Roger. We're seeing it all on TV here. Well, we better back off here and uh, think about this one, Houston. As the astronauts waited, an identical docking probe was brought into mission control. This probe on the command module fits into a funnel-like device on the lunar module called the drogue. Tiny catches on the probe's point and engage the drogue. It was these capture latches that were not holding. In space, the astronauts tried a fourth time. And a fifth. No latch. No, no, no latch. 
In space, on Earth, they searched for a solution. Then, on the sixth try, As they coasted to the moon, the crew brought the probe inside the spacecraft for examination. On Earth, the probe was tested and retested, for we had to be sure that the probe would work for the most critical docking as Shepard and Mitchell returned from the lunar surface. Well, Apollo 14 had several small nagging problems on the way to the moon, the docking problem, the batteries. Uh, was this a, a feeling that the, the crew feel that, hey, something's gone wrong, or is there something uh, with no, the maintenance? If, if we plotted the curve of uh, failures, you know, every mission had their failures, and the program improved as time went on as we perfected the spacecraft. So the numbers of failures was dropping dramatically with each mission. Uh, we felt lucky to have no more than we really did. On February 4th, Apollo 14 went into orbit around the moon. Uh, this is really a wild place up here. Later that day, Shepard and Mitchell climbed into the lunar module Antares and undocked prior to descent. And we're free. Beautiful. And Antares Houston, your go for Bromaro. It's a beautiful day to land at Bromaro. Ten seconds to go. Okay, there's pitch over. Right on the there it is. Right on the money. Right on the money. That's beautiful. Right out the window. Just like the window. Harry Houston, you're a go for landing. Cone Crater, yeah, okay. a major objective of this down. mission to Far Morrow. A hole blasted in the moon's surface Uncle eons down. ago Uncle that could provide a scientific down. clue to the history of the moon, down. the Earth, and the solar system. Feet, right on schedule. Right on schedule now. We're by Cone Crater right outside to my right. Cone Crater itself, the use of craters as a sampling device is very useful because a very large crater obviously excavates a lot of material from down below. So you not only get samples from near the surface, you also get samples that have been excavated from depth. But uh, in addition to that, the uh, Copernicus, the Fromoro site happened to be on one of the very distant rays of Copernicus. And we think that mixed into the soils that were collected at that site is where some of the Copernicus material itself was. 300 feet. Okay. Okay, I'd give, give it a few clicks. You're through 200 feet. Still uh, have for a second. That looks good. No metal here. High percent fuel looks great. Okay, it looks like you're going right over the metal of the uh, triplet. 170 feet out, two feet per second down, 8% fuel, you're looking good. Okay, you can move on forward, you're just barely crossing north Tripoli. Barely crossing north Tripoli. You can land over here, there's some dust, Al. You're on your own. It's starting down, down. Okay. There's good dust. Okay. Down. Looking great. 60 seconds. 40 feet. Three feet per second. Thirty. Three feet per second. Looking great. Twenty feet. Ten. Three feet per second. Contact now. Two stop. Auto. Auto. We're on the surface. Okay, we made a good landing. Roger, Antares. Five and a half hours later, Shepard left the lunar module to begin the first of two explorations. Cutting down the ladder. Roger. Ten years later, 114 hours, 22 minutes after leaving Earth, Alan Shepard stepped onto the moon. It looks like you're about on the bottom step and on the surface. That's bad for it, old man. Okay, you're right. Alan's on the surface, and it's been a long way, but we're here. Four minutes later, he was joined by Ed Mitchell. The last one is a long one. Well, as you walked down the uh, the ladder and got out onto the moon's surface and set up the flag, what was your feeling? Was it mere, here, I'm doing a job, or excited, or was it, were you very patriotic? Well, all, all of the above. Uh, you're busy doing a job. You rehearsed that job. You've got to get on with it. There's the obvious exhilaration of being an explorer where humans have never been before. And certainly there's the 
the patriotic uh, national feeling is that that's somewhat overridden by you're representing the world. You're, you're here on a world mission. Uh, so all of the above uh, kind of fit into the schemes of This is a good place for A. They have an appearance here quite often like raindrops, uh, a very few raindrops have splattered the surface. The quality of the scientific description by the astronauts could be termed by Earth-based scientists only as excellent. But now Shepard and Mitchell pushed on. After a brief stop at a second survey site, they began their assault on Cone Crater, a climb not only toward the summit of a lunar mountain, but back through time. A large crater acts in many respects like a drill, throwing out material from deep beneath the surface. This material should be very different from any we've collected before, perhaps dating back to the origins of the moon and even the solar system. And we're starting uphill now. Planet's fairly gentle at this point, but it's definitely uphill. Why don't we pull up beside this big crater, Dave, take a break, get the map, see if we can find out exactly where we are. The maps they were using had been made from photography from lunar orbit. The hummocks, craters, ridges, and boulders took on a new appearance when seen from the surface. The little limb looks like it's got a flat over there the way it's leaning. Uh, start on up to the rim? Yeah, just one second, though. Hey, pull a while out. We're having all the fun. And the grade's getting pretty steep. Al's got the back of the mat now, and we're carrying it up. I think it seems easier. Well, I tell you, we're really going to get a panorama. We've got a tremendous one here. He just didn't already. Anyway, I'll point to the rim. But the rocks and boulders getting more numerous toward the top here. Now they were working against time, against the oxygen and water left in their backpacks, against the alien terrain. Top a ridge, thinking it's the rim of the crater, and there's another ridge ahead of you. Standing in a boulder field surrounded by rocks 10 to 12 feet long, the astronauts made their most difficult decision. With the concurrence of mission control, they stopped their climb less than 150 feet from the edge to begin the more important job of collecting samples. Uh, in retrospect, the film show we were standing within 50 feet of the rim of Cone Crater. Could you believe that? Didn't know, yeah, we, we believed it. When we saw the, uh, I believed it particularly because I thought we were right there. Uh, <clears throat> uh, the film showed that we were just right virtually on the edge and had we walked another 50 feet over, we could have seen it. But that attests to the uh, undulations of the surface in which it was almost impossible to pinpoint your location precisely. Uh, and the edge of Cone Crater was very precipitous uh, so that we would not have been able to see it unless we were standing right on its edge. But to all intents and purposes, except for the, the personal feeling of looking down, we accomplished everything we set out to accomplish. Captain Mitchell, what was the highlight of your trip on Apollo 14? Oh, um, it's hard to 
it's hard to pick up uh, an incident. Uh, clearly, the, the lunar landing and the time on the lunar surface is a highlight, but also the technological and piloting achievements of getting there, landing, getting off successfully are all vital fortunes of that mission. You said that uh, looking back at the Earth from several hundred thousand kilometers is, uh, gave you an expansion of awareness. What does that mean? Well, I guess the best way to describe it, uh, we've all had our mountaintop experiences, our aha experiences, our peak experiences. Many have had religious experiences. Uh, all of the above apply. It's that sense of uh, seeing something new in a different way, getting out of the trees and looking at the forest, seeing the same old data again, but suddenly it takes on new meaning. And that's really what we're talking about when we say that sort of thing. How do you feel this uh, whole experience affected you psychologically? Uh, well, with a very profound appreciation for the magnificence, the harmony, the beauty, the, the uh, unfolding evolution of the universe as a magnificent creation. Uh, it convinced me that intelligence is really the keystone to the uh, to the universe, not the electron. That uh, matter, mind, and purpose, and intelligence are all interwoven in, in the very fabric of the way the universe is put together. So what do you feel mankind should do before we make our next trip back to the moon? I have a good reason for going. Uh, first of all, the, we will find the rationale, we will find the science, we will find the discoveries, um, sometime in the next few years that will say, aha, if we go do this, it will be of great benefit. Just like it was 30 years after the first discoveries and explorations of Antarctica that we started putting weather stations down. Uh, a similar sort of thing is likely to happen at the moon. We'll find an economic or scientific uh, or humanitarian reason to build a station and go do it. Thank you very much, Dr. Mitchell. You bet. Originally, there were to be 10 Apollo landings on the moon. But budget cuts and lack of public and government support meant that after Apollo 14, only three missions remained. These were to be the science missions. An improved version of the lunar module with more supplies allowed three days on the lunar surface instead of two. The lunar module carried a lunar rover, which could carry the crew and their equipment up to five miles from the landing site. It also carried a TV camera, which sent back extraordinary views of the moon. In July 1971, Apollo 15 astronauts Dave Scott and Jim Irwin, seen here in a lunar rover, landed beside Hadley Mountain, seen in the background in this picture. The upside down umbrella mounted on the rover is the antenna which sent the live television pictures back to Earth. Within driving distance was a large valley called Hadley Rill, seen in the distance behind the rover. Driving on the moon was quite an experience. This is what it would look like if you were a passenger on the lunar rover crossing the lunar surface at a top speed of 10 kilometers per hour. The TV pictures were extraordinary. Here are astronauts Scott and Irwin examining a large boulder. And the other side is in a shadow. I can't really tell whether it doesn't look like it's filled. It's got a fillet on the uh, down slope side and uh, the up slope side is, is open and free. As a matter of fact, it looks like it's almost excavated beneath it. It looks fairly recent, doesn't it? Yeah, it sure does. It sure does. And I can see underneath the upslope side, whereas on the downslope side, it's piled up. Boy, that is really something. Hey, let's get some good pictures of that before we uh, disturb it too much. Uh, Roger, David, Jim. Yeah. Here you crystal clear. We've got a beautiful tally yeah. hole on you and the boulder on the TV. And it uh, probably is fresh, probably not older okay. than uh, three and a half billion years. Near the end of their third walk on the moon, Scott performed a science experiment for the TV audience on the airless lunar surface. Well, in my left hand, I have a, a feather. In my right hand, a hammer. And I guess one of the reasons uh, we got here today was because of a gentleman named Galileo a long time ago who made a rather significant discovery about falling objects in gravity fields. And we thought that uh, where would be a better place to confirm his uh, findings than on the moon. And uh, so we thought we'd try it here for you. Uh, the feather happens to be appropriately a falcon feather for our falcon. And I'll uh, drop the two of them here, and hopefully they'll hit the ground at the same time. How about that? 
The TV camera left on the lunar rover relayed the first view of a lunar liftoff. Apollo 16 astronauts John Young and Charlie Duke landed on the moon in April 1972. By this time, the TV from the moon was not being shown by any of the networks, so a lot of the material you're going to see tonight has never been shown before. In these Apollo 16 highlights, we'll see Young and Duke take pictures of the American flag, collect samples near a large crater where they discovered white soil, and where Charlie Duke was instructed by the scientists on Earth to pick up a rock they had seen on TV and wanted to be brought back. At the end, John Young, who also commanded the first space shuttle mission, will be seen giving the lunar rover a good workout. Hey, John, this is perfect with the limb and the rover and you and, and uh, Stone Mountain and the old flag. Come on out here and give me a salute. Big Navy salute. Look at this. That's a pretty outstanding picture here, I tell you. Come in a little bit closer. Okay, here we go, a big one. Off the ground, one more. There we go. Yes. I'd like to see an Air Force salute, Charlie, but I don't think they salute the Air Force. Yes, sir, we do. <laughs> and fly high and straight and land soft. Okay, Charlie, say when. Here we go. Oh, boy. And here come the Boxy Twins. Uh, do you guys look like you're having a ball? They are. It really is fun. Now, John, look look at that footprint. Look underneath that regolith. When you kick that up a, meter, a centimeter or so under it, it's white. Absolutely white right here. Well, take your old thing and do a exploratory there for a while. Let's suggest that. Oh, just if it's... Look! Look at that! Come over here! Yeah. Look at that. You sure? How about doing the skim well, right here? I just want you to look here. Fly experiments? We don't want okay, a, a top, scoop, uh, but not a skim. A scoop, but no skim there, right? Okay. okay. Had a perfect you guess we just like a scoop here and no skim? Right. Everywhere out there. It's really some crater. As you come around there, there's a rock in the near field on this rim that had some white on the top of it. We'd like you to pick it up as a grab sample. This one right here? That's it. This, this one right here? That's it, you got it right there. Okay, that's a, that's a, that's a football size rock. It's a great Scott size. You sure you want to rock that big, Houston? Yeah, let's go ahead and get it. 20 pounds of rock right there. Yeah. Okay. That's a big class in it, John. It sure has. <laughs> I fall into in the plum prayer getting this rock. would be one more stop before they got back to the lunar module to close out this EBA. With Duke acting as photographer and Young as driver, they put the rover through a full test. Man, you are really bouncing. Is he on the ground at all? He's at 10 kilometers. Huh? He's got about two wheels on the ground. Okay, turn sharp. I have no desire to turn sharp. <laughs> okay, here's a sharpie. Hey, that's great. He's a big rooster tail out of all four wheels. And as he turns, he skids. The back end breaks loose just like on snow. Come on back, John. 
Okay, the DAC is running. Man, I'll tell you, Indy's never seen a driver like this. Okay, when he hits the craters and starts bouncing, it's when he gets his rooster tail. He makes sharp turns. Apollo 17 was launched in the middle of the night, a spectacular sight. Once on the lunar surface, Cernan and Schmidt set out to complete as much lunar science and rock sampling as possible. In these scenes from Apollo 17, we'll see them on the lunar surface and our guest, Dr. Strangway, reporting from Houston on the progress of one experiment, the heat flow. Roger. I was strolling on the moon one day in a merry, merry month of December. Now, May, May, May is the month. May, that's year. right. May is the year of the month. When, uh, much to my surprise, a pair of bunny eyes. Do -do 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 -do. Sorry about that, guys, but today may be okay, December. Okay, battery. Copy that, Jack. Okay, I think I got it. Well, many parts of the LSEP are functioning very well. The uh, heat flow experiment is working excellently. It's transmitting back temperature data. The uh, cooling down is still cooling down from the, uh, the drilling process, and in a few hours, they should be starting to get true heat flow information. For you, someone who has worked so close to the Apollo program, have you, and 10 years later, have you had a chance to really put in your mind what, what the whole thing has meant, maybe to you or to mankind in, in total? I know it's a difficult question, but... Uh... It's easier to talk about me than mankind, <laughs> but... <laughs> uh, I think as far as I'm concerned, what it's done is uh, it's given us a characteristic of another planet. If you like, it's the, it's the life cycle of another object in the solar system. We've known about its composition, we know about its interior structure, we know about the crust and the mantle in it. Uh, we know about the incidences of moonquakes, uh, and something that isn't commonly thought of, because those lunar samples have been exposed to the solar wind for several billions of years, we actually have significant samples of the sun itself, because that material is blown out. It never reaches the Earth's surface because of the atmosphere and the magnetic fields. So. Uh, we even have a record of, uh, if we could ever work it out in detail, we have a record of what was the sun was doing for the last four billion years preserved in these samples. Is that, Very rich in solar wind gas. That's because there's, since the moon's a vacuum, there's nothing between the, the lunar samples and the sun. When a charged particle gets out of the sun and heads on its way, there's nothing to stop it until it hits the lunar surface. Not one thing. Well, we've got our, our hands on lunar samples, and we've had them for 10 years. I think my main question is, how can we learn more about the Earth and the other solar part, uh, members of the solar system, the planets, their moons, by looking at these samples? Well, I think the thing that I've become very excited about uh, in the last few years is to realize what a clue, what a key this, this, the moon was to unraveling a part of the rest of the solar system. Uh, at the very beginning of the program, uh, Harold Urey said when the uh, first sample comes back from the moon, it's going to be the Rosetta Stone of the solar system. and uh, for a long time, I think the, that statement really had to be down, downplayed because it was not the Rosetta Stone of the solar system. What he meant by that is that we were going to get some really primitive material that reflected the time in which the solar system formed. Because of this bombardment we've been talking about, what we got was a piece of solar system history recorded, but really the record is from four billion years on. So we've got a very important clue about the events in the solar system, but we didn't learn a very great deal about the origin of the solar system. So I think you have to downplay the Rosetta Stone aspect. On the other hand, it has been this very important clue to what we can see on the other planets. And just simply looking at some of the pictures of the other planets and comparing them against the highlands and the, lunar, and the, and the Mare, uh, immediately gives you the impression that either they're similar to or they're different than, and for whatever reasons. Are looking at all this data pouring in from Apollo and the Voyager spacecraft, but how much do we really know? There seem to be a lot of question marks on those slides. Where, where do we go from here? Well, you know, I, uh, I give a whole course, I used to give a whole course at the university on exploring the solar system, and I always started off the course with some of the 
the big questions about how did it form and uh, what were the models and uh, that takes a couple of lectures to get through and then I go through all this information and I take them through the moon and the various satellites and the things we've learned and I get to the end of the course and I have to say to myself now which of those questions have we answered and of course the answer is we really haven't answered any of the questions about the origin of it. What we have done is to put some very important constraints on what went on. We know what the magnetic fields were when this happened. We know how some of the satellites have evolved over time. We know something about their heat sources. Uh, we know something about the composition differences. So we have an immense set of constraints that any model, successful model, of the origin of the solar system is going to have to explain. But we still don't know what the right model is for the origin of the solar system. And I guess this is what science is all about. Uh, you work your way at bits and pieces, you get new information, and uh, it doesn't always answer the question that you were asking. So really what's happening, as you said, when you f we're going to take a look at the first lunar samples, you had one or two questions to ask. That's right. But as you learn more, it sort of opens up new paths. Our questions have got a lot cleverer and a lot more sophisticated. Uh, they're no longer simple questions. They're now very difficult questions. Uh, we do know, I think, that the solar system formed at 4.6 billion years. I guess we really learned that from the meteorites, uh, if you re really want to get down to it. Uh, we learned that the lunar stuff was consistent with a 4.6 billion year age of the, uh, of, the, uh, of the solar system. Again, tremendously important constraint. We learned that there was an awful lot of debris floating around the solar system for the first half billion years of its life. And then for some reason it slowed right down and there was very little after that. So we learned about the life cycle of a lot of the planets and we learned a lot about what drives them. We still have really got to the primordial state of what caused them to come together in the first place. Thank you very much, Dr. Strangway. Okay, for being with Randy, us tonight. pleasure. And thank you very much for watching Astronomy Toronto. Again, we're here on the last Wednesday of every month on the Rogers Network. We'll be looking forward to having you join us next time. Bye for now. John Young says they're in Houston.